<laughs> okay, this is um, Dr. Lee Brumbaut at the Nevada Historical Society, and he's the curator of photography. Thank you. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so, uh, Sherry actually kindly put together this PowerPoint display. Uh, she's heard my talks on it before, so she knows about as much as I do. Plus, you can all become instant experts these days with your cell phone, your smartphone. <laughs> you will know more than us in a few seconds, as far as the facts. Interpreting the facts, and you know, that's different. Matter. Everyone familiar with the old camera obscura? Nope. Uh, those actually could be an entire room that someone darkened the window and put a hole in it, and you, you see what's outside, upside down. And some painters used them a lot. They would build rooms like that sometimes, just for that purpose. <clears throat> so they could use it to uh, for drawing buildings and whatnot. So just like a pinhole camera. Exactly. Okay. It's the modern portable equivalent. Who puts it recorded onto? Nothing. Uh, the wall. Of oh, the room. and then you draw it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's uh, still totally manual. I'll butcher the name. Well, writers, whatever. Mathematician <laughs> and instrument maker of a Louisiana University uses a camera obscura to watch a solar eclipse. He publishes a diagram of his method in the radio. The radio. The radio. There you go. I can't speak that good. language. Yeah. Thank you. But anyway, 1544. I think we'll just let Lee do his presentation <laughs> without, don't, don't read anymore. We might be here a long time. But. Yeah, let him give his talk. Thank you. So uh, the next step, naturally, was how do you preserve this image other than being an artist and being able to draw it? So there are various steps in that process. Uh, <clears throat> and one interesting way uh, it was first step was just to demonstrate that silver nitrate was light sensitive that you could possibly potentially create an image with silver nitrate which turns black in the sunlight wow. <clears throat> and then the first person to actually come up with a a way to make a permanent image was yes Joseph Nisifor Niebs. And uh, it was from his window in Lagrave. And it took, uh, I don't think this says, but it took maybe 24 hours exposure. So, you know, several days. Several days, I think. And then, of course, uh, the next issue, as it says, 1816, he succeeds in making negative photographs on paper, coated with silver chloride, but he still cannot adequately fix them. The first step, of course, was with a material sort of like asphalt, light sensitive tar or bitumen. And that method he was able to fix, but it was later destroyed. <clears throat> However, a copy was made, which is now at the University of Texas. I've seen that. Have it? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, the original, uh, <laughs> you can still see it a little bit. It's not totally destroyed. They have to tell you what you're looking at. Yes. <laughs> the copy that Kodak made, which is now at the University of Texas, is the one that's clear. Yeah, it looked like a monster or something behind the man going across the picture. 
Uh, yeah, that's what it was. It's just a shadow. It's just a shadow. <laughs> <laughs> it was the uh, first uh, supernatural photo. <laughs> and this all was on paper and it predates the, the glass. Uh, well, uh, the albumen was even before the paper. Right. I mean, the, uh, the tar right. asphaltum print. Right. By Tumen of Judea. Which, as it says, is a natural asphalt. I still can't remember what that is. I think it's a shrubbery. It looks like a shrubbery. <laughs> it's like a what? Shrubbery. Shrub. Oh, shrubbery. Uh, yeah, shrubbery, oh, buildings, mm -hmm. garden. It's a garden. It looks like, you know, they might be a bird. So, <laughs> it's not quite photography as we know it yet. When you're just guessing as to what, what it might have been. However, he did manage to create the first fixed photograph, but it was not yet quite a practical method of fixing. And then, of course, everyone knows Daguerre, I guess, the first practical system of photography, which was a metal, polished metal plate, silver plated, uh, with uh, mercury. Uh, vapor process. And that is the, his first photograph on there too. And I bought one just for the purpose of showing people. You can pass it around. But like don't touch the image? Uh, the image had to be covered with glass okay. and protected from the light. It was inside of a, a locked Great. Uh, hinged case with a latch. The uh, cheap versions like this have lost the front cover. Otherwise, it might be two hundred dollars. <laughs> <coughs> and of course, you all know. Uh, was everyone smiling in photos back then? No. <laughs> uh, a few seconds to to a minute or so, depending on the, the light, so they weren't a yet able to smile. And as you may have seen in movies and whatnot, they all had a headrest, you know, to, to keep your head still. Uh-huh. So, yeah, Einstein was not the first to come up with the, you know, the scientific look of hairdos. <laughs> Sir John Herschel was one of the most famous scientists of the 19th century. And he came up with the, the term photography. And the other key thing was he in, invented the modern system of fixing the photograph to where it didn't yeah. darken or fade away. And that method, of course, used sodium uh, sulfate, which takes away the unused silver salts that have not yet been exposed to the light. <clears throat> and of course various efforts were made to create a negative that could be printed over and over as well as a way to make a, a paper image like a drawing and the calotype was one of the early processes in which they made a, a paper negative But what problem might there be with a paper negative? Well, yes. And also is the text texture? Paper, uh, no, the paper has a texture to it. You get more paper texture than picture. So it made for interesting artistic effects, but not too practical. <coughs> And then, of course, what we might call photography, modern photography as we know it, came about with the glass plate negative. Frederick Scott Archer developed the wet plate process around 1851. And uh, it led to a whole range of 
additional photographic processes, including all those used up for the present. Would they have copyrighted such a thing? Or is it like patented it, I mean? Uh, they tried, but generally there are so many people working on it at the same time that no one had a clear right. Kodak managed to patent his. <laughs> Next step, of course. Uh, but let's actually go back. I have a few more examples of the what the glass plate negative could lead to, as well as the collodion process. The uh, ambro type was a glass plate negative with black paint on the back, or paper, black paper, put behind the negative, and that turned it into a positive. Who has the uh, daguerreotype? So did you see uh, how silver it is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, can you see the image from every angle? No, no. You have to hold it just right. Mm -hmm. That's another disadvantage. But the glass plate negative, positive, turned into a positive, or reversed, you can see it from every angle. Right? Mm -hmm. sure. And here is the tin type. It's the same idea as the glass plate, except the emulsion, collodion emulsion, is applied to a metal plate that was painted black. Again, it reverses the image. Are any, uh, have they been just stopped? I'm just thinking about the dating and the caring for. If we find something in our families that um, <coughs> is a daguerreotype or a or you know, is it just that's the time frame it was in, we're done? Or is there, did they use it after a certain date? Uh, good question. Uh, they have revived, revived them today. Mm -hmm. So there are fakes out there. Oh, uh -huh. As well as modern fine art versions. Oh, yes. uh, and but if we find them in our families, we're probably pretty close. To yes, them. there is absolutely a date range. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. that's clear. Cool. And the uh, and that would be somewhere from 1820 to 1850. Uh, the garrotype 1839 oh, uh -huh. to uh, 1851. Oh, okay. 1851 glass plate negative. Tin type 1852. So this is tin. So this is not glass. On the metal. Oh, uh -huh. It's magnetic. If you have any questions. It is. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's iron. Oh. The other name for it is ferrotype. Oh, we'll see that. Huh. Well, that's of course, uh, the aerotypes are also magnetic, but they're obvious, you know, being so silvery and hard to see. And so the uh, tintype lasted the longest up to World War II in some rural areas because it was cheap. And some, sometimes that was what they learned, and that's what they kept on doing. So most of the pictures in the West, um, when they were the great expansion to the West, they were um, a glass plate and daguerreotype? Yes, in Nevada it was primarily glass plate. First, the wet plate process, in which they they would have had the piece of glass, Mix up the collodion with the silver chloride, silver salt. Pour it in the middle, you know, rotate it to coat it. Then they put it in a plate holder, expose it, and develop it. And they had to do all that within 20 minutes. Oh, wow. I put your big picture there. Who might have got this a little more font for the right on this one? It says unknown so, on the back. Says what on Unknown. Back? Oh. Well, I will say it's the Lord Conroe. They were mainly small glass plate pictures, yeah. but not all of them. Oh, wow. Several 
a number of photographers made what they call mammoth plate photographs. Wow. 17 by 22 inches. Wow. Wow. That's nice. And hey, this, this one's by Carlton Watkins. Uh, will you move it a little more into the light right there? Oh, I mean, it's kind of funny, but oh, no, that didn't work. Uh, you can come up later. Too. Yeah, Where wow. Is it? It, Glenbrook? Is it Glenbrook. Yes. Oh, neat. Oh, my gosh. So, Are they valuable? Uh, what would you yes. guess? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll try not to drop it. <laughs> yeah. So what uh, they're about $20,000. Oh, wow. A glass plate can be reprinted? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was a great advantage of the new process. Oh, it's just like all the ones up to, to today huh. until you get the digital. You could reprint them. Oh. And now you can see the digital. Is that glass? Glass? So is that a glass with an image on it? That's yeah. What you're saying? Uh, they made a glass plate and then they printed it on paper. Okay. Oh. Just like today. And this paper was albumin or egg white during the 19th century. What year? 1875 or something. Hmm. 73 to 75. So they would print it in the sun. They put that glass plate negative on a piece of paper in the sun, and the image would come up where you could see it. So the egg white is like sensitive. Uh, they added silver salt to it. So they mix up the egg white, you know, the right consistency, add the silver salt, and then swirl it onto the glass plate. Then they do the same thing with a piece of paper later on. Or eventually uh, they could buy a manufacturer. It almost looks like water is spurting up. What is that? Smoke? Is it smoke? Smoke. No. Lumbering. Mm -hmm. uh, lumber mills. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, as far as manufacturer of paper, Kodak, Agfa, and others started manufacturing paper to be printed on. And as naturally, first it was brass plates, then it was film, in film cameras. <coughs> Right, and you send it back to the factory, right. and they process it. And oh, that's nice. Sent you the prints and a new camera. <laughs> oh, it's like, yeah. like these modern instamatics. It was yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Oh, cool. Wow. <laughs> well, they actually just reloaded the camera, yeah. not a different camera. Yeah. So there's the, the summary we were talking about. And then, well, actually there was one innovation with the glass plates, which was the dry plate, 1871, by Maddox. And so that, that used gelatin. The pictures that we see that were taken during the Civil War, mm -hmm. um, Matthew Brady and, and, and that group. His group, yeah. That really um, only 20 some odd years from the guerre mm -hmm. to almost international acceptance by the time of the Civil War. Exactly. It was tremendously mm -hmm. fast evolution mm -hmm. in the 19th century. Right. Then it sort of stayed all the same until digital. Right. Mm -hmm. well, that old build a better mousetrap. <laughs> and the advantage of the dry plate was that you could store it. You didn't have to make it and use it in 20 minutes. You could load your your plate holders, shoot all your plates, and process them month, a month or two later. And of course that was also true with film, which was on a plastic base, of course. And uh, these early <coughs> albumin yeah, prints from the 19th century can be dated to some degree because of the size of the curb that they were mounted on. These fashions came from France. 
a whole series of different sized cards that they would mount the pictures. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Because we do have yeah, some cards like that back. in our office. We've got these little gray cardboard okay. cards mm -hmm. with pictures That's on them. Sure. So if we measure those. Well, the little gray ones might be really yeah, funny. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. These right. usually had a thin border, oh, okay. and they were brown. Oh, uh -huh. And the albumin print, like the big one, is also brownish now. Oh, wow. Originally, they were kind of purplish. Oh. They turned brown with age. Mm -hmm. And didn't they also sometimes trim them down through the years? Uh, so unfortunately, that yes. So that's something else you'll notice. Oh, okay. Even this one was trimmed. Mm -hmm. They trimmed off about $15,000. <laughs> wow. So, uh, in Nevada, as the chart shows, the first ones were the Cartney disease. So, your eight, late 1850s and early 60s ones are likely to be Cartney disease. So, the little two and a quarter ones. And they kind of they make them, buy batches of them, and hand them out to people. They write messages on the back. And, Okay. Sometimes, or just hand them out. Oh, a visiting card. Yes. Exactly. Oh, a visiting. Cool. And uh, business people would use them like a business card. Mm -hmm. Too. They could put their name on them and uh, wear a contact and whatever. And then by the late 1860s and 1870s, the cabinet card was dominant. Which is one about five, five to seven inches. <coughs> Were we slower in Nevada? Uh, just slightly. The styles arrived here pretty quickly uh, with the railroad. Even uh, ship was only six miles, you know, to have a new style. Wow. But as far as the uh, the cabinet, eighteen sixty six, so. Uh, probably common here somewhere between 1870. You got it. 75. Exactly. A little bit later. So mostly they were still Kurt Z in the late 1860s. Even coming from San Francisco, as a lot of those photographers did. Right. And then the uh, boudoir card. Uh, that pretty much arrived here as early as anywhere. In fact, they were here in the 1880s. This is circa 1890. Photographers in Nevada were using them as soon as they can. So would a photographer invest in a dollar amount to be a professional photographer? Um, Probably equivalent to today, several thousand dollars. Yeah, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I do have a question. And they're, you know, it's their equivalent money, which is people under money. Occasionally we've seen aerial shots of photography that obviously predated uh, the aircraft. Mm -hmm. How did they normally do those? Balloons? Yes, exactly. Uh, they used balloons in the Civil War for observation, of course. And Holly, ladies, can you please listen to the presenter? Uh, he was asking about first aerial photographs were in balloons, and then later uh, arrays of kites to take the cameras along. We have some questions here exactly on what some of those were. Sure. We know the cabinet, but we're not sure the Victoria, the promenade, the Vigor, or the Imperial. Those are rarer ones. We just go by the size. Imperial is bigger than... Imperial is more like your your modern 8x10. So it's the, it's, it, it's the image of the family or whatever, but just the size. It's just a matter of the size of the card Got it. that the photo is mounted on. And usually the photo is close to the edge because they didn't want to, you know, they wanted the photo as big as right. possible to see it. Right. So it's not the subject, it's the size. Exactly. And uh, the common ones are Kurt de Vizy for 1860s, 70s, cabinet, uh, late 1860s, 70s, 
and boudoir for 1880s, 90s. However, uh, the cabinet fair kept on into the 1890s. <coughs> and those are the common ones. Then a little bit, uh, well, the same time period, but in Nevada, maybe a little later. The stereo car, stereo car. Everyone know what that was? Mm -hmm. Three dimensional, and you had a stereo viewer. Oh, okay. So it's two photographs side by side, slightly different angle, fools your brain into processing it like your eyes were. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, we just saw the Kodak, which is a round image, so you know, and then the two sizes for the two different years. So that box before you showed us from Kodak, Eastman Kodak, and you actually mailed it in and bring it back out, pictures were, were round. round. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on those, you had an exact date for your family photo. Wow. And then, of course, uh, one of the next big innovations in photography was the postcard. Picture postcards. Everyone would travel and send back postcards. And uh, they became popular at the late 19th century World's Fairs to some degree, but they really took off in 1907 when the post office said you could write a message on the back without paying letter rate. <coughs> so that when they marked it, as they did originally, it was called Divided Back. <clears throat> Lower left. And the top, not yet divided. So that'd be 1906 or, or a little earlier. And of course, uh, as it says, Typically in the 20s, they had a white border. But of course, this is referring to ink printed postcards. Real photo postcards. Are actual darkroom prints. They're photographs in Pasadena. Sure. And those had white borders from 20s to the present. Now, in the 50s and 60s, white borders on all prints tend to get a little wider, like a quarter inch instead of an eighth of an inch. And then there's one that isn't on in here yet. It's called a repro. Real photo postcard. You see an issue with the dating of the postcard versus the picture? <coughs> 1882, yeah. So the image is older? The image is older than the postcard, and that's called a repro. Oh. When they use an older picture on a more recent postcard. Oh. <coughs> so this one that we just passed around is a re re reduction on... Uh, not, uh, not called a reproduction, just a repro. Repro. Oh, These are about ink reproduction. Mary Ann's got the repro. Yeah, you have the real photo postcard. Real photo oh, the real one. Yeah, Mary Ann's got the repro. <laughs> What's the difference here? Like the back. Oh, because it's got the larger right. bottom. Right. But it's also an old photo picture. 1870s or 80s photo, and postcards did not exist. Real photo postcards did not exist. Then you have right. well, ink printed reproduction. It's a separate part process, which is what this is page shows. And the uh, ink print reproductions first were black and white, but hand colored, often in German. But there are also hand coloring firms in Chicago and elsewhere. Right. The original one is very artificial. Look. Yeah. 
So then in the 1930s, uh, one uh, printing firm, Kurt Tyke, started printing on textured, cloth textured paper. And that really took off and took over the entire postcard industry in the 30s. So they're almost entirely linen. And they're still not very realistic. It's still an artificial looking color. Wow. And then in 1938. The ones with the funny colors like They all had funny colors until Kodachrome and Photochrome. Kodachrome is the slide that had first color process with realistic color, 1938. So that was a, the slide or transparency. So the postcards that you guys give away at the, at the <coughs> gift shop, those are those Lynn 1931 postcards? Some of them are turn of the century. Yeah, they're wow. turn of the century. Actually. Actually. The ones I know. Yeah, wow. The ones we, yeah. they were, uh, we had hundreds of them. And they were given to us for that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Just because they're old doesn't mean they're expensive. Right. Yeah. But they're really they're massive. They are. Used. They're I'm sure you cool. went through them and took everything has to do with the stuff you needed. Of course. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, thanks for doing that. I think they're very cool. I do too. But the most expensive ones are the real photo postcards of rare subjects, uh -huh. such as Nevada mining camps, turn of the century much more expensive than any of the color ones. I don't mean to go off on a tangent, okay. but I'm just curious. Does this timeline sort of parallel the movie industry? Yes, it does. Yes. Okay. To be sure. And then uh, after Kodachrome, you remember Ektachrome and Ektacolor? Uh, and then uh, Technicolor for movies, same same thing. They did not create a movie equivalent of Kodachrome. It's too expensive and not flexible enough. But the movie equivalent would be to Ektacolor or Ektachrome. Well, the same with Disney and his... To be sure. And then the realistic color postcards are called chromes or photochromes. Mm -hmm. Starting in 1939, and they get better through time. So if they look really good, they're probably about 1960s. Or yeah, early. you could probably date this by the VW. Thing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the subject is more gives you better clues than uh, the photography history part. That goes with your uh, Red Dog Saloon exhibit, huh? Sure. All those VWs. And then 1970, you have the bigger size that's there. Oh, the 4x6. So, you know, that's 1970 or later. Oh, and if you look at the oldest car, in, uh, the mm -hmm. newest car in there, it's uh, not early 70s. Huh. So you got to know just about everything about material culture to really date a photo, huh? Uh, exactly. Uh-huh. Just about everything. But it's all online now, so it's a lot easier than it used to be. Styles of clothing and kinds of cars. Sure, and Sherry's the expert on, on that part. Mm -hmm. yes. Now this one of the Ofer, this is, would be Kodachrome. No, earlier. It's the Early. divided one. Third exactly. One. They were, they continued to be divided in that there was a space for your address, but they were not literally divided, you know, after the earlier. Later on, they'd say uh, message here or address here, you know. For so when you go to like Virginia City and get your picture taken in uh, old stuff and they do an old picture, hmm? that's really a modern picture that made to look like a state picture. Exactly. And it can be done with antique processes or just modern process made to look old, either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
computer. Yeah. Yeah. Or the computer. Yeah. Yeah. Identifying them. This, um, to this is Lisa's phone. Yeah. You have yeah. an occasion yeah. yeah. to use yeah. the new ancestry process where you just submit a photo and then they tell you who it is and what it is? Uh, no. Okay. I, I personally haven't tried that yet. But it'll be interesting. Let's see how well they do. How did they tell you who? Um, because, I was evidently, I, I haven't used it, but they have this collection of hundreds of thousands of photos that people have submitted. And they match, they match them. Your, one part of them have matches. Right. I hadn't heard that they got them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there are various levels of that. Of course, and the uh, Homeland Security has the most advanced one. Right. I, I think it's it's based on something similar sure. to uh, to what Ancestry has now. But evidently, <laughs> people have been submitting um, vintage photographs mm -hmm. to the point now where they just have hundreds of thousands of these. Well, and of course, one of the big disputes is uh, you know photographs of famous people. Mm -hmm. Because they have they have monetary value if they can be confirmed, you know. so that might be something you know they could try for that kind of thing. So, a, how is a photograph postcard different than somebody just taking a photograph? Because, like, if our family's got photographs, old photographs, mm -hmm. how? I mean, are they good? Very good question. Yeah. Uh, Starting when they became popular, uh, 1907, uh, you could go to any drugstore and they would make your photographs into real photo postcards for you that you could then send to people. It was a standard thing to do. And you could also, if you're interested, uh, buy you know, photography, darkroom stuff and make your own. Ladies, I just can't get over it. I have to keep telling you to be quiet. We're engaged. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it's disrespectful. Oh, wow. Um, so we've covered everything on here, I think. And then the edit one additional level for your family postcards, uh, travels, or ones they had made for themselves, or made themselves. And this is strictly for real photo postcards here, not in print. These are the ones made in the dark room. These are the manufacturers. And the manufacturers put their insignia in the stamp box where oh you God. put their stamp. Oh, up in the little part. Huh? Yeah. Oh. The letters go around the four sides of the stamp box. Mm -hmm. So you can look at that stamp box and then see how long that paper was manufactured to have at least some idea when when the photo the real photo post so this information we're talking Who internationally right internationally yeah. yeah so we're not just talking our world we're talking no. all over the whole Agfa world is germany yeah I, I saw a lot of international context but i was just thinking this is really everything collected all over the world all happening at the same time right? to be sure okay. exactly Velox was a Kodak brand, I believe. Then uh, Kodak insignia proper, they started putting in 1950. Were you looking for the real photo? Who had, yeah, who had this back over there? Yeah. Pass the real one around again. What, uh, what stamp box does it have? Okay, no? okay so what's the, uh, the date range? Right. Now, of course, if there's a picture or something that happened in a given year, you know, you go by the picture. Could um, the History Project have a copy of your PowerPoint? Sure. Is that all right? Okay. Well, it's up to Sherry. But yeah, no, we, absolutely. We I know Lee will want to maybe add a couple things. Okay, but we wouldn't want to put it on our... Our website, but when we're no. working with our photos, no, absolutely. That's kind of was the idea is that with our handouts and the stuff on the website, I felt that it was easy. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I just ran yeah. out of time. I would have printed out like a oh no, that's um, great a slide. And then from here, as I say, you can go online 
to each of these subjects. And there are all kinds of great discussions of each, you know, area, each mm -hmm. process, each uh, way of dating, postcard. And Maybe create a tool, so. huh? Yeah. Create a tool. Yeah, like a if this, then go to this other place, and if not, then go to that other place. Not me. No, no, we wouldn't. <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> She's not volunteering. I might be at my limit today. Well, what would you guess is the most common? Coda. Coda. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> were we the most? No question most, about it. Hmm? Were we were the most de progressive? Do you think? Was what? Were, was the United States the most progressive? Uh, yes. <coughs> uh, the United States became the leader in photography uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the card styles, however, you know that came from Paris. Uh -huh. From, yeah, obviously there's a lot of French. Mm. But as far as number of photographers and uh, photograph great photographers and everything in the United States. And then cameras you can kind of contribute to Germany, correct? Wow. Germany and then Japan. Yeah, and then Japan. Japan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that because we could afford them? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. uh, but as far as Germany, uh, uh, war, you know, technology, yeah. imaging technology for war was part of why Germany had the camera equipment. Mm -hmm. Same on Japan. And uh, they came up with uh, the highest quality glass, which led to the single lens reflex camera. Wow. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do it without, uh, originally without their glass. Then uh, Germany uh, caught up, and of course that was in the fifties, late fifties. Wow, well, something good that comes from war, huh? <laughs> <laughs> same thing. And of course, same thing on the uh, the hand colored photographs. The chemical industry for war warfare led uh, Germany to being the leader in you know color processing of postcards. Also. Mm -hmm. First World War and earlier in that case. <coughs> and of course, uh, Japan is uh, still the leader in uh, digital photography. So Germany is trying to catch up. And the United States has fallen way behind. And of course, some of the early, mm -hmm. early manufacturers, and you can see how the stamp box is arranged besides the, the NOCO one. <clears throat> and then we had a little bit on uh, uh, conservation and handling of photographs and so on. And of course, key things is physical damage, uh, wash your hands for the oils, uh, wear cotton gloves. Uh, it's absolutely essential for negatives because the fingerprints on negatives very quickly become permanent mm -hmm. and will show up in the prints you get made later. And then for storage, acid free materials. Uh, Cotton rag envelopes is the highest standard. Uh, also, archival buffer materials can be pretty good. Are these so standard to buy or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Light impressions, Gaylords, Hollingers. So They're all online. Now. Chris, do you want to know negatives? Negatives. negatives. Five by seven. Okay. Oh. And five by seven and eight by ten oh became gosh. the standard yeah. camera size in the uh, teens and twenties. Yeah. So don't just slide them in one of those three ring binder sleeves that for paper. And they just put them in there. Sticky on it. Ah, uh, no. No. Because no. no. they say they're archival. Well, there are various levels of archival. Uh, the most archival is mylar. 
or melanex, which is polyester. And of course, uh, so in other words, landfills are full of polyester suits that will never go away. It's all <laughs> but polyester has a problem that you can't uh, make seam as well as some of the others. So the next level is polypropylene. For photos or negatives? Photos or negatives. These leaves are for photos, printers. But maximum safety is the cotton rag, acid free cotton rag with mylar if you need any plastic items. What's the cotton rag do? Uh, it's just inert. Oh, you put it with it. You put the negative print inside it. And then you could put a batch of those inside our cotton holder like that. However, you don't want to use buffer materials with color photographs or anything process. He just said something really important with a however in front of it. So. <laughs> you know, as I say, you can look all this up online. If you have the early antique photographs, you don't want to use uh, anything but mylar and acid-free uh, cotton rag paper for maximum safety for the early process. Same thing for color photography. Better not to use those uh, slide pages, especially not ones you used to get free in the mail. Those would destroy slides in a few months. It's because of, it's an inexpensive, um, cheap plastic, and it often <coughs> acts. So, so over a short period of time, it becomes brittle and can and, and mm -hmm. cause the, the negatives and, and the pictures to um, deteriorate as well. It off gases uh, uh, chemicals. No, those as are it actually good. Those Sorry. are polyethylene. Polyethylene is the one. That we use. That's suitable, uh, but the very best yeah. is my art. So or in reality, or polyester. In reality, the old scrapbooks kind of might that the pictures were just simply put on with the little sleeves or little locks are much better than these new scrapbooks that have the plastic on them. In general, yes. If they just had corners. Yes. Now, the problem is that. The 19th century ones were acid free. But not today. Not today. And it <coughs> were exactly, it just, they progressively got more acid as they started using the wood pulp paper as opposed to high rag Isn't it content. Paper? Paper? Yes, it is. So my 100 year old photo albums <laughs> that are just the probably. things are probably. <laughs> Better than older they are, the better. Probably. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you, you do need, need to be careful because your pictures can yes. pop out easily too. So. They might not be old enough though. You're not that old. Yeah, a hundred year old is getting into the paper pulp yeah. era. Mm -hmm. Hundred fifty year old, you know, they're very good, very safe. The albums for the ten types and carte de disease, mm -hmm. those are acid free. Yeah. But the black paper ones for the later photographs are not as as it could be. And they so get worse. The ones from the 1890s would, pretty good. would be all right. Mm -hmm. So all the people that took Polaroid pictures, mm -hmm. their pictures are toast. Uh, Unless they can still be scanned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, what you want to do nowadays is scan. And that's a whole different subject. but. Uh, Epson has very inexpensive professional quality scanners. Uh, Epson 500 series, yeah. 550, 580. That's it. <coughs> you don't have to worry about the light that the scanner you know, burns and light. Not as much with that because it's an LED light. Now, mm -hmm. okay. the older ones were fluorescent that were more damaging. 
All this reminds me of Carrie Porter. When the albums, those albums that came out with the sticky back, remember those? Yes, I grew up with those. That's the worst song. I know, but how do you, now that they're stuck for life, is there any way to... They're not. Usually they come off. Mine won't come off. Really? No. Oh. Then you kind of got it as is. So you can either then remove, you know, scan the whole page and then scan individuals. Um, sometimes we get books like that where we'll, we'll scan the whole page or take pictures so we know the layout of it, but then um, if we can remove some images, but then it gets to the point where that oil and sticky glue has now caused discoloration and, and it actually kind of curves the photo. Um, that's where sometimes all you can do is scan it and then just actually put that in a sleeve or in a file folder, and so it's part of the documentation. So um, it's you, kind of case by case. Is there like a thin blade or a tool that, that helps you remove it's, it from that? It depends on the thickness of the picture, and you have the chance of going right, and right, through, right through it. And if you have newspaper, you know, it, as Lee said, kind of pre 80s. Um, you know, it was very dealing with the pulp, so it had a lot of acidity versus the turn of the century newspapers, which had a different process at the time. So it what so you see your older newspapers that don't are aren't as yellow and as brittle as as the newer newspapers um, before the 80s to the mid 80s, because mm -hmm. those were more um, wood pulp and the acidity level um, is based on how they broke up the fibers, and so acid creates acid, creates acid, so then your newspapers crumble. So at least today, like you were asking me about, even our Xerox papers, now today because of the chemical process, they're able to re um, remove acid in it. And so today, um, you, your photo paper will last 100 years, a minimum. Um, before, uh, before that, uh, museums, and sometimes depends on the piece, you can use a paper called Dur paper um, and a, a Durham bureau paper and that um, has more of a linen um, and longer fiber so that would give you at least 500 years so for for trying to make copies um, if you're trying to preserve documents so um, but yeah um, we have the bound newspapers for the state and so we, we have all of those in the back and so you'll you can look at some of the older newspapers and they're you know and those are all bound you know in leather and they're in very good condition but then you start getting the 20s 30s you know and that mm -hmm. you start they, they break easier mm -hmm. the 50s so so going through some of the courthouses and i know it's expensive they are doing mylar on those old pages of records yeah and that is mylar they yeah you can do um well it's like you never want to completely encase something if possible um, you know, essentially putting this piece of paper in, in a gigantic piece of plastic, that's what they call mylar. Most times we do that with like our maps, but we always usually have a side. But if it's very fragile, we'll actually leave air pockets on the ends. And you want to make sure that there's enough space between it. So just in case you want to remove it, you can actually cut the mylar and then act not and cut your document or your map. So those are things you want to keep in consideration as well. Um, now we own the Grosch letters, and those are that's the earliest letters of the Grosch brothers that kind of discovered the, the the edge of the Comstock load, and they went through a couple family fires, and so um, those were very brittle and fragile condition. Those are completely enclosed in mylar because they truly we scan them. Um, and Lee and I spent, I don't know, a couple months scanning all those letters um, several times and really being able to zoom up the quality for the book that um, Ron James and Bob Stewart put together. But because they're so fragile over time, I mean, we have them flat in a box, they, they're just deteriorating. So at this point, we have them cared as, as best as we can. We've made copies, digital copies and printouts, but um, it's only a matter of time for them to continue to crumble, and there's not much more we can do. So, well, you know, so that's where you would completely enclose it. But um, there, there was a way where people tried to save early documents, and they would laminate everything. And laminate is not a good thing because you can't undo it. The idea, anything that we're talking about, is 
You want to be able to undo what you have done. You don't want to create damage. Now granted, through time, people have learned, you know, that, oh, we shouldn't have done this. Or, you know, you find um, somebody wrote in pin or marker <laughs> in clothing. You're like, oh, you know, but at the time, they were really trying to make sure that we, we knew whose it belonged to, uh, the donor's information. But that kind of stuff can transfer. So it, it, it's just logic. It's very common sense, like Lee was saying. You know, making sure your hands are clean, your surface that you're going to be looking at your family mementos and treasures. Um, or working with you know your collections with the women's project with early photographs, um, you know it's. it's well, I'm thinking of um, Virginia City is is doing this mylar for all of their large record books. Oh wow! And I noticed that they. When so are they taking it, apart their ledger books then? Yeah. With part yeah, of it then? Because yeah, I was saying because you wouldn't be able to keep them in the binders. Sending them everything. out and then rebound again, and I okay. noticed I was back east doing some research. Okay. And they were doing it too. It's not cheap. No, it's not. And but everything I, you're looking at like is like very close. expensive. Um, it, and that's where why so many more people are going digital, being able to scan. Um, so you still have the originals. We're carrying them in a, in controlled environment, um, in you know using correct supplies. Um, sometimes less handling because we're, we have things digitized. So it, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. You know, we don't physically handle the Rush Brother letters. We've got the digital copies um, because they're just so fragile. So um, that, that's interesting. And because Story County, the courthouse, they've been digitizing so much of their records soon, you don't really, won't have to go much to their physicals because they'll have everything online. It seems like the well, direction I, they're you, going. Right, but these I don't think are going to, and they've got just huge volume after volume. Yeah. Uh, so you and I can go through these things, Yeah. but they're on the original page. That's interesting. It's just for, uh, physical protection, I yeah. guess. Yeah, that and that's purpose. just the same thing like with the maps that we have. You know, each of our maps are, are enclosed in a, in a mylar that we mm. care for. But going back to your... Uh, Photo album, of course, first thing you want to scan the whole album, the entire pages. And then you can decide from there where you're going to take them out and individually scan them at higher resolution of each one. And also. Mm. Oh, finish your thought. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, how are documents different than photos? Because we have. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how many generations back, but my great grandfather's Civil War certificate. How do you preserve that? Well, it's kind of the, the same, same thing, thing except really the photograph it has frame, the emulsion. To you have to, in the frame. photograph. You just have to. Cherry will go more into the yeah. next part, but mm -hmm. for photographs, it's the emulsion you have to consider. And uh, so, it okay. says you want to avoid the things that would damage the emulsion, uh, paper clips, tape, and so on. Now, if you need to repair a photograph, you can use archival press-on tape on the back uh, if you need to. But you wouldn't put tape on the front of anything. And then, of course, uh, you avoid rubber bands, and adhesives, and all your storage materials. And you use number two pencil if you need to write on the back your catalog number or your info. And you make sure it's on a hard, smooth surface. One photograph at a time. Can I do it? Let's see it. Okay. So it's as you can tell, photos and documents truly it's it's the same thing, you know, where Lee was passing out the different types of materials. Um, uh, manuscript collections um, include photography. Um, and we have print ephemera in them as well. So uh, we'll, we'll jump forward here. And documents. Uh, documents essentially flat paper. Um, now granted, I do have manuscript collections such as this. That is the, I believe, the First National Bank of Elko, Nevada. And so we have a lot of bank records. So we have hundreds and hundreds of ledgers just from this one collection. Um, and those um, most times are stored on the shelves themselves unless um, they are fragile. We definitely would wrap them. Uh, we also use cotton twill tape and you can tie them up like a present, you know, with a bow. And then that keeps them together. It doesn't 
it's not loose and if you were to pull it off the shelf you know uh, maybe the spine has come off or the front has come off and that would help keep it together so it's um as you can see um the my document collections, you know, I can have drawings and prints. You know, we collect programs, tickets, uh, matchbook collections, uh, posters, illustrations, like from um, Harper's Magazine, the illustrations uh, of the time of Nevada. That's a whole separate collection itself, but that's considered um, documents. Um, we have thousands and thousands of maps ranging from communities to mining claims uh, to all the maps that represent all the ranges uh, of the state as well. Uh, like I said, ledgers, bills, invoices, checks, anything that you can think of, um, letters, correspondence, uh, land deeds, legal documents, marriage, um, birth certificates, and um, you know graduation certificates. Those are, the older ones are quite large. And sometimes they actually would come in a leather leather case that you could uh, wrap up and, and it would be stored rolled. And they would come up about this long. Um, you were saying, you know, how to care for those. Personally, the thing would be to uh, scan it and 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 then have the reproduction out on display and put the original way um, and you don't want to have anything in direct light you don't want to have anything on an outside wall you don't want to i mean you don't want to have anything by a heater or a swamp cooler or air conditioning it's it's those kind of things but that's a lot of common sense you know if you're looking at your house what are the windows that bring in the light so okay this is the afternoon light maybe i shouldn't put this valuable dotsalali basket in the sunlight you know um because it'll age and it'll start to lose some of its color the same can be said with your family photos um watercolors the same thing over time um you should actually put those to rest you should have it say if you wanted to have them out for a while have them out six months put it away for six months you know rotate your family treasures it's those kind of things even uh older paintings uh the reds tend to be a uh, fugitive color so they will start to change color over time and when you start looking at the older paintings then that's why they start to uh, get darker because it, it picks up the pollutants in the air and maybe somebody's smoking um, it, it they all have the same effect um, uh, of all of our collection materials and so um, is working in a museum we have to be aware of of those kind of things and how can we try to help protect our collections but also let you know um, as individuals and as organizations how you can care for your own things so like i said lee kind of talked a little bit about it but truly it's you know having a clean surface as you're looking through your family mementos or as as maybe we're processing a manuscript collection um we, we we're very um, much into detail, attention to detail, and, and completing lists. And the more information, as is, is, you know, with your Nevada Women's History Project, the more information that you guys are putting together in your index, the better it is for somebody to find that record and for you to understand why do we have it or, you know, where it came from. Like, oh, you know, because there were still a few photos that um, c came originally from families, and I know you were trying to find out if truly they can be used you know, for anybody or, you know, whatever the case is. It, those are the kind of concerns that we at the museum have to be aware of as well. Um, Lee's correct. A lot of times when we get older materials, maybe you'll have like a little safety pin. Uh, uh, that used to be an old uh, thing that instead of they didn't maybe didn't have a staple, they would have a little safety pin holding paper together or metal. Uh, there's there's a history of you can probably say a hundred years of evolution of paper clips of metal paper clips that one of my volunteers over time as he's been processing he kept saving them so he has this, them all framed up of the evolution of, t of paper clips. But I mean it's a whole interesting story and and over time too you know if there's any moisture. Um, those can actually get rusty and if if there was any dirt it can leave an imprint and when you take it off then all of a sudden you have this rusty mark on you know on a document as well so it's those kind of things we use actually if we feel it's something we need to paper clip they actually have paper uh, plastic paper clips and those are the ones that we recommend so um, uh, same thing as dog earring you know we try to not do damage if possible. And like Lee said, we if we're gonna write on our materials, we write with pencil, the idea that we can undo what we have done. 
So storage for us is that we keep a, um, a consistent temperature in the building. Um, in the back storage, we're about 67 degrees uh, year round, maybe up to 70. So uh, you learn to wear sweaters and things, you know, and then, then when you're out in the sun, go outside, it's like, oh, it's hot, you know, because you've been in a cold building all day. Um, but it's, it helps with the collections because you're not, the temperatures aren't adjusting. So you don't want to store your family albums up in the attic or in the basement where maybe there's moisture you know, that might wick in, you know, maybe you're in the flood zone, you know, things that you want to try to avoid. Um, and like I said, light, uh, radiators, your vents, you know, if you had a swamp cooler, um, and just trying to keep things unfolded, uh, you know, like Lee was showing you with the file folders. Uh, we have alpha collections, which are individual items that maybe uh, in a folder might have one item to 40 items that we're, we don't consider them a manuscript collection because there's not enough materials. Um, but here I've got a, a little a bachelor club of 1897, a little card, um, and this is in our alpha collection and has a little photo in it, and I will pass it around. It can, can be handled. Um, this as well, I'll let you guys look at. Um, we also include um, bills. This is how we're able to document and keep track of, you know, companies and people that have been in the communities. So uh, you'll be able to see when you kind of move it that it has a lot of dirt on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this keeps it contained. And you left the dirt? Mm -hmm. You don't like take it off with it. <laughs> mm -mm. Sometimes you can, but you know, but then I have millions of documents. So the perspective, <laughs> and also because it's so old that um, it is very brittle and it probably isn't worth trying to, to mess with it. Um, some of this, it is, and because that's a uh, Indian ink, it is. So it's, uh, it's, and I'm sure because, you know, it had been on the ground, so there's dirt, mm -hmm. and maybe it had been exposed <coughs> in an old building. And I'm coughing from all the dirt. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, when you say Indian ink, you mean sepia? I know it was an, a black ink, but, but the term Indian ink um, is the style of ink that was used, but it got exposed to light mm -hmm. or age, and so it starts turning brown. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to have to grab my water here. Yeah. We, we don't have white <coughs> cotton gloves on. You can take a look at it. And Sherry, I'm wondering, we don't have white cotton gloves on. So we should not. Yeah. You can hold it with the folder. That's fine. Okay. And that card is, is perfect. Okay, fine, but don't so. look at this thing. I mean, without. Yeah, no, you're fine. Mm. Okay. Don't Sorry, my allergies long. have gotten worse. So. <laughs> yeah. Makes me <coughs> cough. Um, deterioration, just like Lee said, it's it's based on your environment, you know, if you've got pollutants or um, from the paper processing, you know, like we were talking about early on, it's more rag. And so you have the longer fibers. So those tend to be more flexible and better quality. And so the earlier papers tend to last longer. Whereas then when they started with uh, the me uh, mechanical pulp, you know, uh, wood pulp, it actually, um, they broke down the fibers and there was just so much more acid in there. And that's why I was explaining about the paper is that that's why your newspapers and things are so brittle in the 20s, 30s, 40s in that time range. So, um, but by the 80s, the um, paper manufacturers realized that if they started putting alkalide with the acid, it would help balance it. And so they could help kind of neutralize the acid issues in the paper process itself. And so by the 90s, they actually, all books now um, from that point forward, actually um, had more, quote, acid-free. And then, of course, our copy papers from the 90s into the 2000s, everything now is, is acid-free and at least has a shelf life of 100 years. So you can feel good if you're making photocopies of emails or family documents. They'll last quite a long time. The things that we put in our paper collection that we brought up here, a mm -hmm. lot of that's original clipping. Yes. And um, we've not done anything to stabilize any of that. What we're doing is just getting names out of it. Yeah. Um, someday in this um, far distant future when we're done with that project, we should 
consider stabilizing that stuff? You could make photocopies of them so you have the originals, but then you could have copies that could be handled. Uh -huh. Because a lot of times photocopies are, are cut, uh -huh. you know, because you just mm -hmm. want that little article and yeah. ha maybe has a long tail, but, you know, then you can uh, make a copy of it. Uh -huh. And so now it's, you know, acid free and it's a standard size well, sheet too. Carrie Porter, our archivist, who's now deceased. Yeah. Um, she was very careful with the folders are as free. Like Absolutely. Folders so, but the, if there's six or eight newspaper things in a folder, they'll interact with each other? They can, but it's it's truly, it's the individual paper itself. Oh. And, and so, it you know, it, we, have, we have thousands of clipping files and... And we have papers of different decades, so you can tell how certain ones have already turned yellow, others are not as bad a condition. So maybe we would but maybe going more. forward. Yeah. 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 Well, we we're think about keep, that. Yeah. And we'll keep putting them in acid free folders, huh, Mikey? Yeah. She's the keeper of the folders and stuff. <laughs> and uh, we're, anything we could bring in wouldn't potentially hurt your collection? No, no, because um, for the most part, uh, today, like Lee said, you can buy um, acid-free folders very easily. Uh -huh. Now, online through University Products, Gaylord, um, mm -hmm. Hollinger, Metal Edge, all of these uh -huh. sources um, are very easy, just same as the photo sleeves, too, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you guys about yeah. That kind of yeah, product. Copy papers go for hundred years. Uh, I know that's it. So and then also then being in the folders themselves. Yes, ma'am. When you mentioned wrapping that. Oh, my ledger. Mm -hmm. What do you wrap it in? Um, if say maybe the the spine, maybe one of the pieces have come off. Have it, actually the front has come off. We have cotton twill twine tape, and so it's a flat cotton tape and I usually bring it I'm sorry I didn't bring it up but it comes in this big spindle it's about this tall and it's years that you'll go through unless you're really wrapping artifacts um, and uh, that's a very easy and durable um, uh, material to use if you're wanting to tie up something or maybe maybe you're, you've got larger pieces that maybe you want to drape um, unbleached muslin you could actually tie uh, this cotton twill tape and hold your, you know, even a, a, a cotton sheet that um, doesn't have polyester or something in it, um, you can actually adhere that. So that's what I would use. We also have, say, maybe it's in, in I don't have a box, maybe it's much bigger, you know. Um, uh, I also use polyethylene foam. It's actually, foam comes in uh, three, four feet rolls that are oh my gosh gigantic and so we'll cut sheets and we can actually fold it up almost like a, a present and and tie it and then that truly is covered and um, can be used but uh, sometimes with manuscript materials such as these it had to be kind of a case-by-case -case basis because then you'd have to if somebody because people come in for a research library Wednesday through Saturday and depending on their requests you know, we have thousands of manuscript collections and materials that people are going to want to come um, to see. They would have to unwrap. So um, we do sometimes put restrictions on pieces if they're in fragile shape. But, um, you know, we, we, we look at each collection and try to decide what's the best thing we do to help care for it. And, um, you know, if, if it needs tissue, you know, to divide um, a ledger, maybe pages, we can do that. Um, or, you know, if we've got... Uh, photo, you know, maybe we have a, a Bible, you know, this is a small family Bible, but, um, you know, I have Bibles that, you know, are two, three feet in size, and those can be wrapped, because those aren't handled very often, um, but yeah, we, we, we collect it all, and um, if you have questions about any types of material, we'd be more than happy to answer them. So how much storage um, actually, this building is deceiving. Um, <clears throat> the front part of the building that that we are in, that is part of our museum, that was built in '68. We have an addition to the building. That's the back half that you don't really see unless you're driving up Virginia Street, and it's still very deceiving. Um, it is 15,000 square feet with compact shelving, and um, 
we're running out of space. <laughs> I'm actually, um, I, I'm, I've taken over as manuscripts curator towards the end of 2011. And so I've been having volunteers process, put things into our database so it's much more searchable. But um, I've been doing a lot of shifting and trying to reorganize and get things more in numerical order. But I, I, I believe that you can use your space as best you can and rethink space. Um, but, uh, you know, existent in 111 years, you know, we, we have a lot of material. So Lee's photography collection probably ranges around 500,000 photos. That doesn't count the photos that are in my manuscript collections. We have all the bound papers for the state. So uh, we have uh, probably thousands of bound newspapers and individual papers here. That's cut off with the microfilm years? Uh, well, and we have all the microfilm too. So, so you don't collect current newspapers? We do. We collect three oh. newspapers, oh. absolutely. But we collect only at microfilm at that point. Oh. Um, so we have that. At some point, we may have to consider offside storage for our bound newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, um, you know, I, I have items like you were looking at those folders. Maybe has one item, but then the largest manuscript collection I have is Truckee, Mar Truckee Carson Irrigation District, which um, of course is the most uh, controversial and important collection. One of them that we have here that is still used today for water rights wow. and lawyers come in to uh, help to do research and that uh, 180 boxes plus I don't know probably at least a hundred ledgers it's mm -hmm. it's a large collection that that gets used as cases and, and research come up so you know how something that's already water damaged or moldy but it's dry yes we what do you do with that well we have many of those <laughs> in our collection as well um, because it depended you know were there records from a building that um, had been abandoned for many years and people went through and pulled out those records uh, y you can take a look at them you know maybe uh, it's there's several ledgers you can actually put them in boxes you can leave them on a shelf um, we use a uh, uh, steel you know powder coated uh, metal shelving for all of our shelving in the back so it doesn't interact you know say if you had at home and you're trying to store things uh, if you had to use wooden shelves make sure they're painted um, the idea that you know you have different gases the construction especially if it's press board uh, uh, you it can off gas over time and can cause problems with collection so I recommend at least painting it a few times to get a good coat or even then pu putting um, an ethyl ethylene foam as a barrier between your boxes so whatever you can do you know um, maybe your uh, maybe you have a guest bedroom you know that uh, you're not using some of those closets well you could actually store some of your items and boxes in your closet so it's in better shape or versus on the floor instead of on the floor because you know you can get silverfish you know maybe a mouse or you know, you know other things to take in consideration over time or oh whoops you know other things and then something spilled you know maybe you had a flood I mean it's just all those things so um, always taking consideration if you can to elevate certain family mementos and, and pieces that you you don't want to Sherry, potentially get damaged. Microfilming the newspaper archive dot com or which all of the microfilm yeah. machines have got are missing many of the issues. Mm -hmm. Do you have some of those missing issues that yeah. are not microfilmed? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Are they microfilm? Can you are they easily accessible? We have that's part of the question and I know at some point we're gonna have to get a grant probably to have somebody do a complete inventory mm -hmm. so we can truly get the actual count of what we've got because I mean we have three um, carriages full, both sides jammed of bound newspapers by, you know, um, you know, kind of an alphabetical order, but I also have I don't know. I, I I don't even know how many big boxes of bound of bound papers in boxes all through my um, my carriages as well. So that will help us determine what maybe hasn't been microfilmed, and they also did really bad quality as well. And so um, 
just because you had it, they didn't do good quality checks right. at the time. That is like, oh my God, you can't read it. Mm -hmm. At least we have today, we've got two of the digital um, microfilm scanners. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little more time consuming to use, but um, a perfect example is that Eureka, about 1885, 1887, had really, they did a really bad job with some of those papers. And you have to do a complete reverse, and you can modify the light level on the computer. And that was the first time I was able to do research. And that was because of our essentially $10,000 microfilm readers. So if I came up, let's say there was a run in the RGJ, or the, not the RGJ, the journal mm -hmm. of um, 1924. Yeah. And I came up with the missing uh, issues in the microfilm. Would I be able to come up and look at them? Yeah, absolutely. And because um, uh, newspaper archives does not have all of the all of the the papers. I mean, they're progressing and, and adding more to it all the time. But yeah, definitely, we're the place to go to. And at some point, I hope to add newspaper archives. It's just one another one of those tools, as well as Ancestry, and also have. Uh, Wi-Fi. It's just those are those essential tools that you need to have in a research library, and just those are those givens, those expectations that people have. And so, um, you know, uh, as a whole, uh, those are goals I'm hoping to build in my budget here in the next year or two. So, um, I uh, have to note that it's four o'clock. Yes, and I apologize and, uh, that we talked a long Charlie time. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, actually, no. It was the last thing was just showing you some examples of um, types of archival supplies we use. You know, literally, we use brass safety pins if we um, use um, ID tags because brass doesn't rust versus sometimes the steel. Um, you know, uh, we use acid free tissue, but we use it by the big roll. It's just, you know, it's more economical, the different types of boxes and things that we handed around. But we just thought it'd be important for you just to be able to visually see some of the different supplies. And then, any questions? So, we, we talked a lot about stuff. Please know that we're here to help. That's part of our obligation, I believe, um, as being uh, preservers of state heritage to see what we can do to help you protect and care for your own family treasures. So thank you ladies so much for your second year being here. So.